And Lord, all our other requests that are on our hearts and in our minds and, and for our neighbors and for ourselves, we lift them up to you. We know you hear us. Uh, even the innermost part aches of our hearts, we know you hear us. And, um, and we also offer to you all our praises for your goodness and all the good things we have in life as well. Lord, we praise your name. Pray this all in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Please stand for our confession of faith, and since it's a communion Sunday, we'll be using the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of His Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Ghost of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the Scriptures, and ascended into heaven and is seated on the right hand of the Father. And he shall come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets, and I believe one holy Christian and apostolic church I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated. And I invite the ushers forward for our tithes and offerings. And at this time, we'd like to, um, we have something a little bit different today, a little special music in both song and in word. Um, if I could have you open your red hymnals to number 141, we'll sing one verse. I'll give you a second there to find it, 141. And we'll sing just verse 1. <laughs> The reason we sang that is we have a very special guest traveling from afar, um, was instrumental with this song, was also instrumental in her um, Faces of History school project, and, and this person is going to come up, I won't tell you who it is right now, and uh, share a little bit with us. Marvelous people of this audience, I stand before you today, or should I declare, here I stand, I can do no other. As a man who has been driven by faith and convicted to challenge the traditions and practices of the Catholic Church, 
I have stood up against the powerful institution of the church and sparked a revolution that has changed the course of history. I was born November 10th, 1483 in Isabel, Germany. At a young age, I was sent off to boarding school and then to the University of Erfurt. Being an excellent student, I soon earned my bachelor's and master's degree, and I was well on my way being a successful law student. While I was traveling back to the university after visiting my parents, I got caught in a violent thunderstorm. A lightning bolt struck, and I fell to the ground, frightened for my life. I vowed to become a monk if I lived through the storm and so I've got all the days of my life. Too much displeasure of my father, I entered the monastery and started a new life as Augustinian monk. As a monk, I sought earnestly to find the acceptance from God. Through much studies and teachings, I began experiencing doubts about some of the practices of the Catholic Church. For example, the church accepted money for sins to be forgiven. This practice was known as the sale of indulgence. Eventually, I decided, and I decided to act and fix the problems in the church that I cared about so deeply. But this action, which happened October 31st, 1517, which I will tell you later, if you so indulge me, would get me into serious trouble. After coming into conflict with many powerful leaders of the church, I was excommunicated from the church or officially thrown out of the church on May 25th, 1521. I was declared an outlaw by my country and this meant people could arrest or kill me. So I fled to Wartburg Castle near Eisenach. I disappeared into hiding with the help of some friends. They actually kidnapped me, <laughs> but safely brought me into hiding, while hiding. <clears throat> I, Knight George, spent most of my time writing about the errors in the church. I have not revealed my identity yet, and Knight George is simply an alias to keep me safe during my time in hiding. In addition to these writings, most importantly, I started translating the Bible into German. It was a strong desire of my heart to have the Bible in people's own languages so they could know the truth for themselves. The invention of the printing press in the century would also aid in, in the spread of the Bible into the hands of the people. Some of my greatest works are still ahead of me, including translating the entire Bible into German, making it accessible for many for the first time, writing catechisms for instructing families in the word of God, and composing hymns to teach Christian truths. As a theologian and a professor, I have written extensively on the matters of faith and emphasized the importance of salvation of mankind through faith alone. Individual conscience and the priesthood of all believers, my writings and teachings have laid the foundations of the Protestant movement, which has had a profound impact on Western culture and society. My writings have spread far and wide and continues to inspire and guide people around the world. So, who am I? I am a man who nailed 95 theses to the doors of Castle Church in Wittenberg, Germany in 1517. The act I previously mentioned that has brought serious trouble. I am a man who, sit, who challenged the sale of indulgence and sparked a debate that ultimately led to the split between the Catholic Church and the Protestant movement. Who am I? If you ever forgot who I am, remember our history sentence. In 1517, Martin Luther began the Protestant Reformation by printing the 95 theses that made Pope Leo X excommunicated.
Lord, we thank you for every good and perfect gift. Receive these offerings to spread the glory and the gospel of Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray, amen. Please be seated, and I'll invite our musicians forward to lead us in song.
all God's people said, amen. We'll call on Pastor. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for your word to us, and thank you for sending Jesus, your Son, to be our Savior. Please bless this reading, preaching of your word. Open our eyes and hearts and ears to hear it and receive it and put our full faith in you, and we may have life in your name. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. So today we're looking at John 17. Uh, which is commonly called the high priestly prayer of Jesus. And uh, I love John chapter 17. It is uh, rich and deep, and uh, it's something we'll turn to over and over again, and I get more out of it every time. And uh, well, although it is straightforward, it is, it, the meaning is quite deep. And so hopefully I'll uh, communicate some of the of the depth and goodness of the of Jesus prayer for you today uh, so these words these are his final words shared during the Last Supper and um, these are words are his prayer for the Apostles but also he makes it clear this is for all believers all who will ever believe in his name he prays for here and the purpose of this prayer is his his hope here in, in saying this is actually found in the last words of chapter. 16, uh, which if you look there, chapter 16, verse 33, it says, I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart. I have overcome the world. And I have a, a quote here from Martin Luther. I, maybe I should ask Martin Luther to come up and, and say it. But <laughs> uh, Martin Luther has put into simple words the purpose Jesus wanted to attain. In order that through the word, caught with the ears and held in the heart, they may be comforted, joyfully rely upon it, and be able to, see, be able to say, see, see. This is what my Lord Jesus Christ said. So faithfully and fervently he prayed for me. This have I heard from his mouth. And what is needed here is that one hold to the word with his whole heart and take comfort in that. So when God, God's word catches hold of your heart, it changes you. It sets you apart. And it keeps you in him. In other words, you are, you are set apart by God. God sets you apart. And he does this wonderful work in your life. And he, de he desires to do this for anyone who will turn to him. And I'm going to start here at verses 9 through 11. And here in these verses, Jesus prays that God would keep their people united in his name. Jesus prays that God would keep their people united in his name. Start in verse 9. I am praying for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. And I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world and I am coming to you, Holy Father. Keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. So Jesus starts out. Who is he praying for? He is praying for his people who are set apart from the world. They were given by God to Jesus so that he might bring them back to God. So the Father does not lose them by giving them away. Instead, the believers belong to them both forever. And this is a belonging of connection, of likeness, of family, of identity and belonging. 
And how were they given to Jesus? Well, the verses just before this, verses 6 through 8, actually explain this. And we could summarize it this way. God granted those, the believers, faith so that when they heard God's word revealed to them by Jesus, they believed in him. God's word awakened faith in them, and they received the grace of God in Jesus and were changed. Listen to verses 6 through 8. I have manifested, this is Jesus speaking here, I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you, for I have given them the words that you gave me, and they have received them and have come to know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. We see here, so God's word, it changes your heart. It sets you apart and places you under the grace of God in Jesus. God gives you to Jesus, to his death and resurrection that forgives your sins and cleanses your heart and renews you. And it's great. God's grace to you opens your heart so that you can truly know him. And in this way, of Jesus giving, give, awaken you by his word. In this way, all that belong to Jesus belong to God the Father. And the verses say, furthermore, everything that belongs to God the Father belongs to Jesus, because he is God the Son. So there is this perfect union between the Father and the Son. And it also tells us that Jesus is glorified in believers. He is glorified by his power demonstrated in them as he saves them from sin, as they are transformed and they honor God the Father, and as they are guarded against evil in the world. All these things in the believers glorify Jesus who has done this work in them. But soon Jesus will not be with his disciples in person. So Jesus prays that God will keep them in his name. And to keep means to protect and preserve. And we think about this when we think about food. Well, how am I going to, how am I going to, how am I going to keep this food? Well, you protect it in a sealed container and you preserve it within, usually with something inside it that preserves it from spoiling, spoiling within. And God protects us and preserves us both externally and also he preserves us within. And you are kept, you are protected and preserved in God's name, which is the same name which the Father gave to the Son and which the Son revealed to the disciples, as we read in verse 6. Now, to reveal God's name means to reveal who he is and what he is like. It's to know him. And so God keeps you. He protects and preserves you. He keeps you by his knowledge in you. He places you in him so that you're under his protection, and he places the knowledge of you by his word in you so that you are preserved within yourself. You're preserved against evil. And the greatest danger to us from evil is the corruption that would tempt your heart to turn away from God. But by his name in you, you continue to trust him. You are faithful to him, and you live consistent with who he is. And Jesus also prayed that we would be one. He prayed his disciples would be one just as God the Father and God the Son are one. And the unity found in Jesus is is very different from the conformity in the world. The, The world imagines unity is accomplished by everyone conforming to the same thing. Now, it might hide that behind nor noble platitudes. Um, they may even disguise it, <laughs> but the world, the conformity of the world, it demands complete conformity, and it does not allow anyone to question its agenda. The unity of God, on the other hand, is unique because God is three in one. He is God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. 
So this is a unity that transcends human understanding. They have three distinct persons, but one substance, one will, one heart, one mind, one nature. And the, the knowledge of God in Jesus Christ, given to us by His Word in you, that connects you in a, in a living connection with the unity that God has, that is His. So the, our desire, our longing for true unity, we have that from God by being connected with Him. And that, and that unity from Him, that it transforms your heart. It changes you on the inside so that you truly desire to be like God. And that's the difference there between the, the, un, the conformity of the world that forces con, that, that conformity and the transformation of God that changes your heart so that it is your true desire to be like Him. And this is the power of God's Word within our hearts. It makes that change within you. And His work in us, it unites us. And we are also, we experience that unity as we love and seek God together with each other. So God keeps his people united in his name. Now verses 12 through 13, Jesus prays that his disciples would have his joy. While I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I have guarded them, and not one of them has been lost except the son of destruction, that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I am coming to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. Jesus first here in verse 12, he, he deals with his disciples' doubts so he can make way for his joy to be filled to the full in them, filled to overflowing. Jesus did preserve his disciples from evil. None of them were lost except the son of destruction. And the, right there is the, the place of doubt. And so Jesus, he dealt with it head on. Here's a doubt he knows his disciples are going are to have later. So he deals with it right away, head on. What about Judas? Wasn't he lost? And if he was lost, might the other disciples become lost? Might you? Might I? That's the doubt here. Just by, just by who, what happens to Judas, there is the doubt. And we consider all the disciples. After Jesus' arrest, they, the disciples were all scattered. They all abandoned him. So they were not feeling like very faithful people at that time. And they, they probably wondered. They probably looked at themselves and saw their cowardly, unfaithful hearts. They probably feared and wondered if they too were lost. And each of you will face times in your life where you will see the ugliness in your own heart and you will realize you are not as faithful or as good as you had thought yourself. And you might even worry if you too are lost. But Jesus gives you the example of Judas for your encouragement to give you hope which might seem bizarre to us at first, but if we look at it, we see the hope Jesus has for us here. So let's remind ourselves this was the Last Supper, and, and the Gospel of John, he covers the Last Supper for, from, from chapters 12 all the way through. They start in 12, and he leaves it in 18, so it's a long part of the Gospel here. And in chapter 13, Jesus told his disciples one of them was going to betray him, and he said, it's the one who I give this morsel of bread to. And then he handed it to Judas. And then he said, you know, what you, what you are about to do, go do. And Judas got up and left. And the disciples missed it. They're like, oh, maybe he's going, to, he's pro Jesus probably sent him with the money to go buy something for the feast. Yeah, that's what he's doing. They missed it. Like he, he just said, it's the one I give this bread to. And he hands the bread. And the disciples don't get it. And so the, the point is for us, it's during this prayer, then Judas is already gone. 
He's not here for this prayer. He's actually out committing his betrayal right then as Jesus is praying. And Judas is not the exception in the sense that Jesus was not powerful enough to protect him. Jesus knew who would betray him, as the, as the morsel demonstrated. And the scriptures foretold that Jesus would be, port- be betrayed to be crucified for our sins. So it, it has to happen. That's why he's sent. Now when we consider Judas... He chose to betray Jesus. Out of that, that's from the darkness in his own heart. That choice is on him. And Jesus must allow it to happen because he must fulfill his mission to be crucified for our sins. And so the, the real tragedy here is that when Judas realized what he had done, and later he does, he feels the full weight of that betrayal he did not remember all the words of grace and forgiveness that Jesus had said throughout his whole ministry. He did not remember any of this. Instead, he despaired and destroyed himself. That is the real tragedy of Judas. Now, why is this, why is this good news for us? <laughs> right? this, this is a tragic story. Why is this good news for us? It's good news because evil did not overpower Jesus to steal Judas away. Jesus permitted Judas to be lost. But God's offer of grace always remains for you. Jesus, Jesus is already crucified and raised from the dead. There's no, it is completed. There's nothing left to do. His words of grace, his promise of forgiveness to you stands forever. It is always there for you. And we see then that Jesus is, he is able to save anyone. He's able to cleanse any heart. Now, and so we see his disciples, they were preserved. Now, yes, when when Jesus was taken, they, they did scatter. But Jesus in his high priestly prayer, he's praying for that very time that he knows is coming. He prays God would, that God would keep them. When Jesus is taken, that God would take, would keep them and preserve them during their time of fear and doubting. And I I think maybe, perhaps, those disciples, maybe they recalled Jesus' words from John 10, 28 through 29. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. No one can steal you away from God. Jesus is raised from the dead, and he can save us from anything, even even if we have turned our backs on him for a season. He can turn us back to him in faith. He can cleanse us from sin and forgive us and renew us. And what was true for the disciples is true for you. Romans 8, 38 through 39. For I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Jesus fills us with hope and with joy, and his joy is the unity and peace and delight he has with God the Father from that relationship, from their connection It is his joy also to save you from sin and connect you with God the Father so that you can share in their unity, peace, and joy. And your joy is also in your salvation that you have in him. And you have joy from knowing God. So Jesus' joy, the joy that he offers to you, it is an endless fountain that you can always refill from. It's better than the water dispenser and refrigerator (laughs) that never seems to run out, right? (laughs) But the joy in Jesus is always cool and refreshing and it is always there for you to draw from. And it's the word of God that brings you the joy that Jesus has for you. And then verses 14 through 19. 
in these verses, we see that Jesus gives God's word, which transforms, keeps, and sanctifies his people. Jesus gives God's word, which transforms, keeps, and sanctifies his people. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world, and for their sake, I consecrate myself that they also may be sanctified in truth. The chief threat to your faith is the world system that opposes God and seeks to undermine your faith and turn you away from Him. The world, the, I'm sorry, the, the word, it's the word that turns our heart toward God but it also turns our, your heart away from the world. So you no longer share the same nature and desires and, and qualities as the world. So believers are, are now foreigners to the world. The world hates them as traitors. And those who do wrong, they, who want to go and do wrong, they hate those who will not join them. They hate them because they're afraid they're going to report them. <laughs> They also, they hate them because they, they remind their conscience that what they're doing is wrong. So the world hates the godly. And they oppose the godly. And they, try to, and they will try to undermine your faith and recruit you to join them. And this shows up in many ways. It's not just people face to face. It's all the ideas of the world that connect to you, that are put and exposed to you in, in so many ways, and it can be in songs, movies, advertising. It's all the ideas of the world that oppose God and seek to undermine your faith. But against all that, I would remind you, you have been changed by God, so you are different, even if many days we don't feel as different as, as we wish. <laughs> and this difference, it's not because you are special. God didn't change you or pick you because you were special. It is all his grace. It's a gift of grace to you. And it's a gift that he freely offers to every and any person in the world. And the difference he's made in you, it will bring opposition from the world. Let's, let's be honest and real about it. The world, it's going to bring, it's going to invite opposition from the world. You being different, being like Jesus. But that's exactly what makes it worthwhile because now you are like Jesus. You have the unity and peace and joy that Jesus has. And so the world, it's, it's going to rage against you. It's going to try to disrupt what you have in Jesus. But Jesus gave you his word so that you may have joy in this world even as you experience hate from the world. And that would be It'd be very nice if, as soon as we were saved, God would just take us physically out of the world, right? And we could just leave all the suffering and, and animosity behind. I think we all, in days, we wish for that. Um, but he does not do this because there is work for us to do. Jesus sends out his disciples just as he was sent out. We continue his mission. He accomplished the forgiveness of sins for all people by his death on the cross and his resurrection. And we continue his mission by spreading that good news. And so that's why we remain. While the world hates us and the world, the world creates an us versus them mentality, Jesus sends you with the message of salvation to save those who hate you. And his, remi his word reminds us that we, we are not against the people who are lost in the world. We are against the spiritual forces that are using them. Ephesians 6, 12 teaches us, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, 
against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. So the people who are lost and do not know God, they are still precious, immortal souls whom Jesus died for and who the message of forgiveness is for. And so we are not against them. We are against the spiritual forces that are using them to oppose God. But we have great encouragement. Be encouraged. The same word, that word of forgiveness, the God's word that called you and changed your heart can also change their heart. So while we work the mission of God, Jesus prays that God would protect us from the evil one. The word that called us and transformed us is also the word that sanctifies us against evil and sanctifies us for God's mission so that we can serve others in his name. God protects your heart from evil by causing holiness to grow in you and be part of who you are. Growing in virtue is part of your protection against the corruption of evil. Um, and we just think of examples here. Honesty is your protection against committing lies. Patience and self-control are your protection against rage and violence. Contentment is your protection against envy. On the other hand, the sins of the world, they undermine what you have in God. Lying divides unity. Rage disrupts peace. Envy poisons joy. So to protect you from evil, God's Spirit uses God's Word to sanctify you in holiness. But sanctification is not just for you. It also equips you for God's mission. And we read in, the, in those last verses there, Jesus set himself apart. He set himself apart to be crucified for your sins and raised for your renewal. His consecration makes your sanctification possible. Verses 18 and 19, they parallel his sending with our sending, his consecration with our consecration. We are consecrated, sanctified to be sent out. So sanctification equips you to do good for others in the name of God. It equips you to tell the truth with love as God has loved you and shown you the truth. God's Word equips you to be patient and gracious, gracious with sinners as God has been patient and gracious with you. It equips you to help others in need as God has delivered you and your need. And Jesus, He connects all this sanctification with God's Word, with the Word He has given us. God sanctifies us in His Word, and His Word is truth, is the truth and it's powerful to reveal the truth to your heart and in your heart. And it shows you the knowledge of God, the corruption of evil, and the goodness of holiness. And his word sanctifies your heart so that you grow in virtue. So you have strength and courage to withstand evil. And so that you are equipped to love others in his name. Jesus gives you God's word which transforms you, keeps you, and sanctifies you. So hold on to his word because it is your comfort, joy, and strength. Amen. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for your word which reaches our hearts and calls us and wakes us up and changes us and transforms us and keeps us and protects us against evil and, and sanctifies us more and more into the image of your Son. And we pray that we would take hold of this, that we let your words, your promise to us uh, be the cornerstone, the, the, the solid rock in our heart that we rest upon, that we lean against and that we take full confidence in. And may your word transform us to be strong and courageous, noble and holy for you. And so we may do good to others in your name for your kingdom and glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to turn in your hymnals to hymn number 553, Oh, what a wonderful, 
wonderful day. purpose to come to the Holy Supper of our Lord Jesus Christ, we should carefully examine ourselves as St. Paul exhorts us. For this holy sacrament has been instituted for the special comfort and strengthening 
of those who humbly confess their sins and who hunger and thirst after righteousness. But if we do examine ourselves, we shall find nothing in us but sin and death, from which we cannot set ourselves free. Therefore, our Lord Jesus Christ has had mercy on us and has taken on himself our nature, that he might fulfill for us the whole will and law of God, and for our deliverance suffer death and all that we, through our sins, deserve. And to the end that we should confidently believe this and be strengthened in our faith, he has instituted the holy sacrament of his supper, in which he feeds us with his body and gives us to drink of his blood. Therefore, therefore, whoever eats of this bread and drinks of this cup, firmly believing the words of Christ, dwells in Christ and Christ in him and has eternal life. We should also do this in remembrance of him, of his death and of how he has delivered for our sins and raised for our justification. And with grateful hearts, we should take up our cross and follow him. And according to his commandment, love one another, even as he has loved us. For we are all one bread and one body, even as we are partakers of this one bread and drink this one cup. And uh, I'm going to invite uh, Randy to come forward and help me prepare the elements. And then after I've said the words of institution, the ushers will direct you to come forward. On the night in which our Lord Jesus Christ was betrayed, after he had blessed it and given thanks, he took the bread and he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples saying, take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same manner, he took the cup. And after he had eaten, and when he had give, blessed it and given thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, drink, each of you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. And so the, uh, in the cup trays, the outer tray is the wine, the inner one is the juice, and so you all offer to you and you may take the cup that you wish and then I'll ask now the ushers to invite you to come forward and to stand before the altar. Please kneel as you are able. The blood of Christ shed for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. The Lord bless you and keep you blood of Christ shed for you. The 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 blood of Christ shed for you. Our crucified and risen Lord Jesus Christ, who has now bestowed upon you his holy body and blood, whereby he has made full satisfaction for all your sins, strengthen and preserve you in the true faith unto life everlasting. Peace be with you. Amen.
Please kneel as you are able. The blood of Christ shed for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. Lord, bless you and keep you. The blood of Christ shed for 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 you. Our crucified and risen Lord, Jesus Christ, who has now bestowed upon you his holy body and blood, whereby he has made full satisfaction for all your sins, strengthen and preserve you in the true faith unto life everlasting. Peace be with you. Amen. Please kneel as you are able. The blood of Christ shed for you. 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 blood of Christ shed for you. The 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 blood of Christ shed for you. Lord bless you and keep you. The blood of Christ shed for you. For you. Our crucified and risen Lord Jesus Christ, who has now bestowed upon you his holy body and blood, whereby he has made full satisfaction for all your sins, strengthen and preserve you in the true faith unto life everlasting. Peace be with you. Amen. Please kneel as you are able. The blood of Christ shed for you. 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 The blood of
blood of Christ shed for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. Our crucified and risen Lord, Jesus Christ, who has now bestowed upon you his holy body and blood, whereby he has made full satisfaction for all your sins, strengthen and preserve you in the true faith unto life everlasting. Peace be with you. Amen. Please kneel as you are able. The blood of Christ shed for you. 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 Our crucified and risen Lord, Jesus Christ, who has now bestowed upon you his holy body and blood, whereby he has made full satisfaction for all your sins, strengthen and preserve you in the true faith unto life everlasting. Peace be with you. Amen. Please stand and join me for the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Receive the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.
how good.